I just want to give you a word uh, as we look forward to next Sunday. Uh, you do not want to miss being here next week as uh, we have uh, something very special I'm looking forward to. And even though it's in the middle of Advent, it's still all about what God does. And as we anticipate His coming into and being reborn in us again, next Sunday, Frankie Cameron is going to be sharing his testimony with us uh, from his, how God has reached him. And I, I, I just, it's, it's a story we need to hear. Thank you, Kurt, for sharing your testimony with us a few weeks ago at, at your baptism. Stories we need to hear that God is still working and speaking to hearts and lives and changing them for Him. And it's an encouragement to those of us who maybe have suffered with addiction or maybe of some sort. Maybe it, it, as those of us who try to make sense out of how God works in our lives. It will be an encouragement to you. And maybe you know of somebody. Get with them. Bring them with you next Sunday. It's also going to be an encouragement to those of us who have been praying for maybe a long time. We've been praying for loved ones who need the Lord. And as an example for Brother Joe and Linda and this family, Lisa, that they've been praying for years, 40 years, praying for, for their son Frankie to come back to the Lord. And so, don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. So next Sunday will be just a, a, great, a great time as we, as we get to experience and hear firsthand from Frankie. He's a, he was a little nervous about it when I, I told him that's going to be our sermon next Sunday. You're, you're going you're gonna to share your, your testimony with us. And uh, so just, it, we need it. And, and if you know somebody, it, it will be a great time for you to, to come and, and just to hear firsthand from somebody who's spent time in prison, who's had drug addiction and alcohol, and you just name it, uh, a life of sin that God can radically change, radically change. Yep. For his, for his kingdom and for His purpose. And so you'll want to be here next Sunday and to hear this and bring those with you who will who need to hear that as well. So as we look forward to that during this uh, time of Advent and preparing and anticipation, it will be a, a great time. But today, here we are again on this, on this Sunday of Advent. And I, I draw your attention to the book of Romans. The Apostle Paul's writings in Romans in chapter 15, and we're going to pick up the verse 4 as we look at this passage of Scripture this morning. Would you stay with me for a little bit, please? That we uh, change your position a little. I don't want you getting too uh, tired and, you know, get sleepy ahead of time. So, let's follow together, if you will, as we read from God's Word. Romans chapter 15, beginning at verse 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, as it is written, Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again, it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope for the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Praise God. May God add His blessing to this His Word. And may let's recite again our motto together, if you can, please. All together. Heavenly Father, I give you permission to speak to me, to speak through me, to do whatever you want in my life. I trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. you
bem vestido. There are two basic attitudes for life. One of hope and one of dread. One of trust and the other of fear. One of optimism and the other of gloom. Two basic attitudes for life. Not too long ago, there was a misprint of a weather forecast that read like this. There is a 5% chance of today and tomorrow. <laughs> a 5% chance of today and tomorrow. I would hope that the odds are better than that, wouldn't you? I would hope so. And then, in a Frank and Ernest cartoon, you see Frank rousing slowly from his sleep and then looking out at the sun coming up and he says very dryly, well, the sun is rising in the east. So far, so good. <laughs> mm -hmm. So far, so good. I was reading, I was trying to, to share with my wife a little bit last night, but I, I was reading earlier, a few weeks ago, the great writer Luigi Pirandello once told a story about a man filled with so much dread that it drove him mad. When he fell in love with a woman of his dreams and he pretended that he didn't care a whole lot about her because he was afraid that if he gave into his feelings of love for her that he'd lose her. So he's playing it safe. So he kept this display of, of, of disinterest so long he almost lost her. And when he did finally ask her to marry him and she accepted, he nearly went crazy planning the honeymoon. He told everyone that they would be going to Florence and Venice, Italy. Instead, he took his bride to Naples, the opposite direction. This way, he felt like he could trick the misery that he knew would be awaiting him in Florence and in Venice. Trick it. It was the only way that he could enjoy his honeymoon in Naples. What a terrible way to live. And you know, it just reminded me that there are some people who live with so much, such a feeling of dread and doom about their lives that they dismiss the possibility of joy. Just live in a gloomy atmosphere all the time. I, it, it's horrible. And even when life is being good to them, they just know it can't last forever. You been there? Maybe you know somebody, right? Maybe it's you, I don't know. But you know, they just, they just those people, they just know that whatever's being good to them, it just, it, there's, there's an ulterior motive for this goodness happening. That somewhere, sometime, somehow, something out there is going to happen to them that will wreck all their best laid plans that'll frustrate their fondest dreams, that'll crush everything that they hold dear, and are just wiping it all away. Well, that's one attitude towards life. Fortunately, though, it is not the Christian's attitude toward life, or it shouldn't be the Christian's attitude toward life. It was certainly not the Apostle Paul's attitude, to be sure, the Apostle Paul knew that we live in a very difficult world. He knew it firsthand. In fact, someone has said, and I read this a long time ago, that someone said you could sum up the life of the Apostle Paul in three categories. He's either on his way to jail or in jail or on his way home from jail. <laughs> the Apostle Paul. And it's true. He experienced more than his share of sorrow and suffering. But the Apostle Paul knew that somewhere, sometime, somehow, something good was there waiting for him. He knew that tomorrow would be a better day than today. And he believed that lasting joy and peace were not only possibilities in life, but they would someday be permanent realities. He believed that with all of his heart. And it comes out in his teachings. 
This is why he writes here in Romans chapter 15, verse 13 of our text. He says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, this is the season of Advent when we celebrate the God of hope. The, the mood of Advent is one of joyful anticipation. It, it infects all of society. In fact, some of you are old enough to remember back in the 1970s. It was a very uh, turbulent time in our society. And so, do you remember the Doonesbury comic strip? Anybody remember the Doonesbury? Very, it was a kind of a political satire. There was a Dooms, Doonesbury a cartoon during those turbulent times in the 70s that showed the campus radical megaphone mark falling off to sleep. And above his head, you could see his thoughts. It's Christmas Eve, and, and as a, a tired and disappointed and disillusioned student activist drops off to sleep, the next frame shows him sleeping. And the frame after that shows him stirring as if startled by an unexplained noise that happened. And in the final frame, he explains, I thought I heard reindeer. <laughs> the, the joy of the season, joy of the season of the year was intruding even into the generally cynical Doonesbury cartoon strip. Well, all the bells, the lights, all the sights and sounds of this special time of the year speak to us about hope. Speaks to us about hope that God is alive. That love and peace and goodwill are still very viable possibilities. There is far more than a 5% chance of today and tomorrow. Far more than that. Because a babe born over 2,000 years ago in a little town called Bethlehem. Hope came into our world. Hope that is unquenchable and eternal. Hope for you, for me, for our world. Hope came alive. There's a beautiful story back in the book of Genesis in your Bible. Where Abraham, who is still called Abram at this time, and is complaining to God. <coughs> He's complaining to God that he has no heir to, to take over his house someday. And the writer of the book of Genesis says in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5, he goes on and says that, that God brings Abram outside and, and says to him, Look at the heaven. Look at the heavens and number the stars, if you can count them. If you're able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. As many as the stars, you can't even count them. That was God's message of hope to Abraham. You see, that's the call that God always gives to us in our times of doubts and despairs. Look at the heaven. Number the stars if you can count them. That's your blessings. That's what's coming to you. Wow. Do we really, really believe that? You see, during, during the Advent season, of course, we need to look for only one star. Amen? A star that shines much brighter than all the rest. It's the star of Christmas. And it's always the world's greatest symbol of hope in our world and in our lives. The greatest symbol. May the God of hope, writes the Apostle Paul in Romans 15 verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him. So that you might overflow with hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do we get his message? <laughs> well.
Well, let me share with you just a couple of thoughts that come to me from this. A couple of thoughts about Advent. Are you ready? Number one. Advent is, first of all, hope for the world. Hope for the world. The great writer H.G. Wells once uh, wrote a story. And the story was titled, In the Days of the Comet. In the Days of the Comet. And in, in that story, Wells is somewhat, it's somewhat typical science fiction fantasy. And he says that a mysterious green vapor of unknown origin descends from the clouds and covers the earth. And the vapor has this immediate effect of putting all of the earth's people into a deep sleep for three days. And when they finally awake after the three days, something amazing has happened to them, these people. Their inner nature is just somehow radically transformed. <laughs> All the petty quarreling and fighting comes to an end. And, and instead of each person seeking fame and power and wealth, the people of the word, world seek to serve each other. And love and kindness and generosity become more important than greed or success. In short... The perfect society kind of emerges after they've fallen asleep for three days out of this murky stuff that happens. A society in, in, in which the dignity of every human being is honored and everybody lives at peace. You say, wow, that really is a fantasy. Well, it's not so far stretched, actually, because the prophet Isaiah actually looked forward to that kind of day. He looked forward to a day when, as he says in, in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 6, he looked forward to the day when the wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, and the calf and the lion and the yearling will all be together. And a little child will lead them. Sounds far-fetched, doesn't it? That's what Isaiah... Of course, Isaiah was not... Anticipating some green vapor enveloping the world that came down out of the clouds. No, Isaiah was prophesied. He was prophesying, as he said in, in verse 1 of chapter 11, and, he, and it's, the Apostle Paul quotes it here in our, in our chapter, chapter 12, or verse 12 of chapter 15, he quotes it that a shoot that would come from the stump of Jesse would come forth. Isaiah prophesied. The Apostle Paul reiterated it. It came. And that is why Isaiah's, it was just kind of Isaiah's way of saying that there was a Messiah coming who would establish a new world order. Who would bring into being a new kingdom in which love is more important than power. And service is more important than domination. So Isaiah prophesied the coming of the Messiah. And John the Baptist then saw himself as the herald, the herald for the Messiah. The, the herald is John the Baptist, the one whose job was to prepare the way for the Messiah. Now, the concern, the concern of the prophets, however, was not only one of personal salvation, but also the salvation of Israel. And that through Israel then, the salvation of the world. So it kind of was a snowball effect, but it had to start with them. It started with me. It starts with me. And then it goes to my community, and then it extends from there until it keeps going around the world. That's what Isaiah saw. That's what John the Baptist saw. That was the concern of the prophets. What good is it if we Save the individual, but leave him in a world that tramples down his dignity and crushes his aspirations. What good is that? Not much, is it? We need to affirm, really believe and affirm that when the Messiah, the Christ, came into the world, he brought with him a seed. He brought with him the seed of a new kingdom. 
That's what he brought. A kingdom that is still alive. That is still at work. Whenever the name of Jesus is on the lips of all believers. It happens. That's what comes around. It's a kingdom that has dispelled darkness. Has dispelled ignorance. Exploitation of human slavery. Everywhere that the good news is faithfully proclaimed. That's what happens. No tyrant can forever suppress it. No evil can forever resist its fury. <laughs> no wonder John spoke with such starkness of the wrath that was to come when he said that the gates of hell itself cannot prevail against the kingdom of God which came into the world with the birth of the Christ child. <laughs> no wonder... No wonder, no wonder the angels sang in, he in the heavens and the wise men bowed in adoration before the babe. And as Philip Brooks wrote it in his song, those events that occurred in the little town of Bethlehem, when he said, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. That's what he saw. Advent, you see, is hope, first of all, for the world. It's hope for the world. Number two, Advent is also hope for us as individuals. Individually providing hope. You see, Advent is hope for you <coughs> and me. Advent. I was reading back in, in London during the Second World War. Hitler's war planes were bombing that great city with regularity. And in order to safeguard the children, train loads of them were evacuated out to the countryside. Somebody asked a young little boy one time, where, where are you going? The little boy thought for a minute, and then he just replied, I don't know, but the king knows. <laughs> I don't know, but the king knows. You see, we are in that same situation. We don't know what the future holds. But our king knows. The one, he who is king of kings and lord of lords, he knows. We can trust him. Regardless of who's president. Regardless of what is happening around the world. Regardless of what is happening around our country. That we shake our heads and we, we can't figure it out. He knows. And if we will trust Him, He will fill you to overflowing with hope for you, for me, for the world. We're reminded this season of the year, we're reminded that this is God's work. Amen? Amen. And He is at work in this world. And even though we might be surrounded by darkness, we know that there is a light shining in the darkness and that darkness cannot overcome. Amen. That's the word of hope we have from His word today. <laughs> oh, I, I was just reading something just this past week, in fact, about how, uh, how ISIS and uh, these terrorist groups are going to attack our electric grid and going to leave us, you know, where we get no control. I don't know how that all happens, and it may happen. All I know is I've got to trust in the one who knows it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can keep trusting him. He gives me hope yes. for today and tomorrow. And even the prospect of death cannot dispel the believer's sense of anticipation of what God has in store. And let me tell you something, friends. ISIS or any terrorist group has never come against the power of a mighty God that I serve. Amen. And 
they have no idea what they're up against. Do we? <laughs> That's quite a question, isn't it? A man by the name of Damon Runyon, some of you may remember him, he once wrote a very charming story about a man that he called Doc Brackett. Doc Brackett was a beloved old physician whose office was open to the poor and the needy. He would get up in the middle of the coldest night and, and ride 20 miles to doctor a sick woman or a child or to patch up some fellow who got hurt. Everybody in town knew Doc Brackett's office over Rice's Clothing Store down down. It was up a narrow flight of stairs. And there was a sign at the uh, foot of the stairs, and the sign said, Dr. Brackett, office upstairs. That's it. Doc, Doc Brackett never married. And the day he was supposed to marry, he got a call to go out into the country and doctor a Mexican child. His bride-to-be was so angry that she canceled the wedding. Broke it off. But the parents of that Mexican child were very grateful when the child recovered and became well. For 40 years, the lame, the halt, the blind of that town had climbed up and down those stairs to Doc Brackett's office because he never turned anyone away. Doc Brackett lived to be 70 years of age and then one day he just killed over on the sofa in his office and died. He said he had one of the largest funerals ever in that part of the town, that part of the country. Everyone seemed to turn out. The townspeople wanted to erect a nice tombstone for his grave, but they couldn't agree what should be engraved on the stone. So it sat there, plain. It drug on for the matter, drug on for a long time. Nothing, nothing was ever done. Then one day. Someone noticed that there was already a proper epitaph over Doc Brackett's grave. And it seems that the parents of the Mexican child that Doc Brackett had saved many years back had worried about him having no tombstone. And so they didn't have any money to buy a marker, so they simply took the sign from the foot of the stairs at Doc Brackett's office and stuck it over his grave. <laughs> now he had a very fitting epitaph. And it read simply, Dr. Brackett, office upstairs. Amen. During this season of the year, we pay homage to the Doc Brackets of this world. And we declare that not only is the world a better place for all their efforts, but now they actually reside in a better place as well. Dr. Brackett, office upstairs. You see this morning, because the God of hope, because of the God of hope, you and I are free to choose the attitude with which we confront life. We can believe that there's just a 5% chance of today and tomorrow. Or we can believe the good news of Christmas that God is alive and well and at work in our world, bringing in a kingdom of love and justice and freedom for everyone. <clears throat> we can face the future with fear and foreboding, or we can trust in the God who has sustained us through the years and has promised us that He will never forget us nor forsake us regardless of the situations we might find ourselves in. Regardless. We can choose to live in continued darkness or we can step out into the light of hope and triumph and eternal victory. We can live for ourselves alone, or we can make the world a better place for everyone to live. I ask, doesn't the good news of Advent and Christmas change your attitude about life? 
Doesn't it make, it, doesn't the good news of Advent and Christmas change your attitude about life? Doesn't it make you anticipate that sometime, somewhere, somehow, something good, not evil, is out there waiting to happen in your life? It is. It is. And this is the kind of change that takes place when the Christ child is born anew in our hearts. Not something that happened over 2,000 years ago, but it's up to date right now. Has he been born anew in you this morning? That's what Advent is all about as we anticipate, as we look forward to the change He makes in me to affect the change in those around me to then affect the change in those around them until the whole world is affected. That's how it happens. Thanks be to God. Wow. Well, this morning... This is our first Sunday of the month, and it is communion time. Special thing, you know, a few weeks ago I talked about those who do things behind the scenes, and Claude and Adria are so faithful, and backup, uh, Jeanette is their backup to fix the communion for us each month. So it was unnoticed, but thank you. Appreciate your service in that way. But I, I want to invite our, our servers, if they will come, please. And then once again, just to remind you that you do not have to be a member here at our church to partake of communion and to be around the Lord's table. But we ask that as you, as you partake of the Lord's Supper around this table, that you use it as a time to draw close to Him. And if you haven't given your life, he's not been born anew in you, would you use this time to let that happen? A fresh and a new again. Even if you have already done that before, let it be a renewing of that. That this reminds us of that very fact. So as you take the, the wafer and the, the cup, just take it and hold on to it until all have received, and then we will partake of it together. And we will let you know when that happens.
You are the ever-present God, and I pray, the Lord, you would fill us with the joy of the wise men and the shepherds of, of long ago as they awaited the coming of the Christ child. And we receive this cup this morning in prayer and thanksgiving at this time of, of rejoicing because of, of our celebration of the event that is to come. So in memory of our Lord Jesus, we drink the cup and we ask your abiding presence be with us throughout this time of Advent in all of our lives, that you would bless our service, Lord, as we dedicate it to you. Lord, we're here. We're here as an expectant people, Lord. For certainly at Christmas we are we're like we're like little children who view the season with sparkling eyes as if they have seen the greatest gift in the world. Let us, Lord, like the children, become excited about the baby in the manger, born to show us your will, to share with us your love, and to tell us that your kingdom has come to us and can be shared through us with the entire world as we spread the hope of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that the Christ coming is not just some distant event that took place in an obscure place long ago, but it's something that repeats itself again and again within us. Oh, how we rejoice that the living Spirit of the Lord guides us in faith every day and walks with us through every valley, stands with us in all the upright living whispers to us like a still small voice and abides in our hearts and our minds with the vision and hope of things eternal. So thank you. Thank you, Lord, that in this sacred season we are moved from carelessness to thoughtfulness. We are moved from selfishness to giving. We are moved from being hard and callous to being kind and gentle. From indifference, move to being concerned and caring. Lord, would you let such a spirit abide with us? Not, not just in this season, Lord, but throughout the journey of life. Let it be so. As you awaken us to the hope that is in us, that, that like the Apostle Paul said, that we might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let it be so in us. So now, Lord, we ask that you make our souls a manger wherein the Lord of life is born again. I pray this in your most holy name. Amen. be here next week and, and you see those who aren't here today, give them a call. Remind them that they need to be here next Sunday. And those others maybe that you think that you thought of earlier that need to hear a message of, of hope and encouragement that uh, of how God works in our lives, share it and bring them with you next Sunday. But now, my brothers and sisters, people of God, We go from here today energized to serve faithfully and lovingly in the days of this week ahead. And I pray that we might live in the light of God's redemptive love. His redemptive love that enables us to share the hope that we have. His love causes us to overflow with hope. Share it. Share that love and that hope with everyone you come in contact with. And may we speak the name of Jesus often and lovingly. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. Thank you. You are dismissed.